Miigwech, um, Fred, that was, that was wonderful. Could you please introduce yourself? Ah, bonjour, everybody. I'm Fred Dejarli, Wasamuganini in Indigo, Makwen Dudem. Um, uh, I work here at NAC as a spiritual advisor, elder in residence. Good to meet everybody. Miigwech. Miigwech. And then I'm going to introduce the rest of the team. Tina, um, sorry, Michelle, would you introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle Corcoran, the nurse manager for the MAT program here at NAC. Miigwech. Nikki? I'm Nikki Jardina. I'm the infectious disease nurse at NAC. Tina? I'm Tina. I'm the harm reduction supervisor here at NAC. Lindsay? I'm Lindsay King Cooney. I'm the community and tribal engagement specialist here at NAC. And um, I'm Kari Ravi. I'm a family practice and addiction medicine physician here at NAC. Um, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Tina. Once we get our slides up. Also, we're all in the same room, but we're using one speaker, so my voice is going to come through Tina. So just so you know, we're not. Just um, working with our PowerPoint. So today, Dr. Robbie is going to be talking about harm reduction and pregnancy. Um, and we're doing like new, we're doing a new intro thing for our echo. Um, for, I see a lot of new faces on here. So for anyone who doesn't know who we are, Native American Community Clinic um, is, is in South Minneapolis. Um, We've been here since 2003 and we offer primary care, medication for opioid use disorder. Um, we do infectious disease, intervention and treatment, social service support, dental, behavioral health, um, elder care and traditional healing services um, and harm reduction. So that's who we are. And then just a few guidelines for the session. Um, no protected health information um, shared on this platform. Um, please mute yourself. And if you're not muted, we'll probably mute you. Um, we welcome you to eat your lunch. I know that this is over the lunch hour, so feel free to do that. Um, if your screen is on, don't worry about um, us seeing you eat. Um, we invite you to use the chat function to ask questions or make any comments. And yeah, announcements. So in two weeks, we have Melanie Nadeau from the University of North, North Dakota um, talking about centering culture and the treatment of opioid use disorder with American Indian and Alaska Native communities. That's October 19th. And then November 2nd, um, Judy Rosenberger from Red Door Clinic will be talking about HIV care and disease investigation services. Um, these are just a few other echoes that we recommend. Um, Indian Country Echo, Stratus Health, who we partner with um, here, and then Hennepin Healthcare. Um, they have a lot of topics on OUD and harm reduction. Um, there's many, many echoes. So if you want any more information, um, you can ask us in the chat. Um, we do also offer continuing education credits um, for anyone who's eligible. So um, all you'll need to do is fill out a survey that I'll email out to you after this session to receive credit. Um, and then case presentations. Um, if you have a case presentation um, that you want to, to let us know about, um, it's great for us to learn from each other and our experiences. So feel free. Um, it looks like Tina's email is on here. Otherwise, you can talk to us in the chat. And then with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Robbie. So, um, so I'm gonna be talking today um, about harm reduction and pregnancy. Um, sorry, 
Oh, I'm doing my own slide. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So my objectives today are to um, identify the features of harm reduction relations to pregnancy and pregnancy care, to apply cultural humility and trauma-informed care when giving writing care to pregnant women, um, and to formulate an approach for treating pregnant women with substance use disorder, regardless of their readiness to be sober. So just to, to provide some context uh, in, term, um, in terms of prenatal care, uh, Native American pregnancies are twice as likely, Native Americans are twice as likely to have late or no prenatal care. Um, Native Americans in Minnesota are 7.8 times as likely to die during or within a year of their pregnancy. Um, and Native Americans in Minnesota have two to three times the infant mortality rate as non-Hispanic. Um, so our, pa our patients um, experience a lot of barriers to prenatal care. Um, systemic racism leads to a lack of trust in healthcare providers and systems. Our patients experience, um, have high out-of-home placement rates for children. Mandated reporter laws um, have recently undergone changes, but um, are harsher in Minnesota than, than in other states historically. Also, drug use being criminalized is, um, makes it more difficult to, to seek care. Um, lack of understanding of substance use as a chronic condition and the moral judgment that comes um, with that is a, is a problem. Lack of culturally competent care, lack of trauma-informed care, historical trauma, and um, health disparities which lead to high relative risk scores and poor health outcomes. These are, these are all ways in which systemic racism impacts, impacts our patients as they're seeking care. Um, generally, social determinants of health um, make it difficult to, to seek, seek treatment, um, lack of insurance, lack of transportation, lack of food, lack of shelter, and then just the basic hierarchy of needs. If you, you are not, not able to have your basic needs being met, then coming into the clinic and doing, um, being proactive with your health kind of falls down the list of priorities. Um, so pregnant people often delay or don't receive care due to concerns regarding restraint pregnancy, CPS recording. Uh, pregnant people often don't trust providers to treat them with respect. Um, and there is, a, there is that, that general stigma that substance users are bad parents and can't care, provide care for their children or don't provide care for their children. And that, that, that stigma is even greater when you act sort of like when you overlay expectations for women and, um, and what, what they should be doing as far as taking care of their children and, and the judgment that comes with that. Um, as far as opioid use during pregnancy, um, the rate of opioid use disorder is um, um, amongst women who are pregnant and Native American is about one in 10. And the rate of neonatal, neonatal abstinence syndrome for Native American babies is eight times higher than that for white babies. So as far as um, what, what our patients experience, our pregnant people are more stigmatized than other substance users. Um, as I've mentioned previously, uh, perceptions of poor parenting are there if substance use is pregnant. Um, people ask, what about the health of the baby? What about the rights of the baby? Um, if they really, if people, a person really loved their child, then they wouldn't be doing this. Um, there's a sense that if a pregnant patient is using, that they should be able to stop, you know, like I would stop if it was me. So there's like just this um, over, not, not a great understanding of what it means to be chemically dependent and, um, and in this context. And uh, when a person's pregnant, withdrawal and cravings are just the same as if they're not pregnant. And in fact, a lot of times can be worse. And, um, pay, and the patients at the same are really, really have a lot of internalized shame, a lot of internalized stigma around this, and that makes them feel even worse and, and kind of actually amplifies the cycle. Um, a lot of people feel like just because of the general stigma and lack of understanding around chemical use, they feel that they should be able to do it on their own. They should be able to do it without any help. They should be able to do what they, what they, what they want to do during their pregnancy, which for most of our patients is to not use um, while they're pregnant. And they, they just feel they should be able to just sort of flip, flip the switch, make that decision and do it. And it's just not that simple. Also partners and families' perceptions and understanding around chemical use and what it means and how 
the di how difficult it is can come into play. And also their understandings around um, of using things like um, Spox or other MAT and what that means um, can, can impact a person's decisions. Um, and and that and coming into that, of course, is like Suboxone is just another drug. Um, and a lot of my patients express concerns about babies going through withdrawal. Um, and there's a lot of concerns about how high the dose, the dose is, and they're gonna have worse withdrawal, where you know, a lot of st our studies show that there's no change, there's no difference in withdrawal when it's dose dependent. Um, I'll talk a little bit more of that about that later. Um, um, so in terms of mandated reporting and um, and what that means for our patients, we I think it's worthwhile talking about the history of child removal and talk about the boarding schools with it, um, that a lot of Native Americans experienced in the U.S. Uh, starting in 1800s, the government used boarding schools to remove Native American children from their homes. Children were forced to cut their hair, wear European style clothes, and they were punished if they used their own languages or practiced aspects of their culture, including religion and ceremonies. This went on in Minnesota even into the 1960s, and um, we see trauma um, from people who were not raised by their own families um, and, and within their own communities and from their own spirituality and religion um, in today. And uh, in 2016, Native American children were more than 17 times more likely than white children to be removed there from their homes as a result of parental drug use. Um, it's just, it, it just becomes a continuum where, where the method changes, but the impact and the trauma continues. So um, because of, somewhat because of mandated reporting, people using drugs during their pregnancy don't trust their healthcare team to protect them if they disclose use. And when looking at Minnesota Med Medicaid, um, 34% of parents with a baby diagnosed with neonatal absence received inadequate or no prenatal care versus 14% for non-NAS births. So what that what that's what that says, the, the, the implication of that is that uh, women, women who use are less likely to seek treatment um, and get help before the baby's born because um, they're there because of these fears around in mandated reporting. Um, so important to note that in July of last year, the Minnesota mandated reporting laws were changed uh, due, to, due to efforts from community and providers. Um, and uh, the change, whereas previously we were, providers were mandated to report chemical use um, during pregnancy. Now, if a, if a provider is providing or collaborating with other professionals to provide a woman with prenatal care, um, postpartum or other health services, including the care of the infant, we are exempt from reporting. Um, the, the caveat to that is if a patient is lost to follow up after the, the health professional has made attempts to contact the woman, then the professional is required to report. Um, and I, th I think, and here's, the, here's the, the changes that were made to the thing, to the um, mandated reporting laws right here, just so you can see. I think a lot of providers are not really aware of the changes and so mandated reporting continues. Um, if, if, if providers are able to not report and to meet the needs of their, of their patients while they're pregnant and using, it, it does make it possible for CPS to continue to work at keeping children safe while, and also removing barriers to prenatal care. So this would allow patients. This allows patients to engage earlier with primary providers without the fear of mandated reporting, and pa patients are more likely to connect with MAT and other treatment options. And um, the providers it does also still have to communicate to patients what to expect at delivery. So, for example, the conversation that I have with my patients now, I let them know that we don't need to report. I make sure that they understand that um, that if we lose touch with them, then I may need to I may need to report them. And I also so and I and then what that means at delivery is a social worker will will a lot of times be called to assess. But if a patient is able to be sober for a month or, or two months, and I and I think it probably it probably varies by case by case, um, that a lot of times the babies will be able to go go home with their with their parents if um, if they're able to demonstrate that they have a stable a stable place to have the have their baby and to also not have chaotic 
Gabby Houston. So the conversation that I'm having with the with the parents, I'm much more collaborative. Like you know, what is your goal for your for your infant? Are you do you want to be sober before the baby's born? And then and then just to talk about um, about if if they want to go home with their with their baby, which they they have all they all do. Um, that that to create a common goal of like how can we get you there before before baby's born and get you to a place where that you have you're in a stable environment you have housing um, your chemical uses is is is, is um, treated adequately and um, you have a safe place for yourself and your baby. Um, they, um, still, there's a there is still a lot of fear for pregnant patients are using. It's still see patients who have refused to seek care and have showed up at term. I will also say though that for the first time I think I, I have within my panel uh, three patients who are actively using that are, are are seeking connection and are working on their goals while they're while they're using as opposed to waiting until until they are desperate you know like at the last minute or really ready to take the third step. I'm having patients who are taking the first step and it's just it's such a pleasure to be able to help them on that journey. Um, I also think for a lot of the experience and competence of the individual providers and system it, systems is uncertain for patients. So not all prenatal providers and clinics and hospitals are experienced in treating people who are using drugs um, and not all providers have a harm reduction philosophy. So patients don't know what they're going, what they're gonna be met with when they seek care. And, um, and that has a lot to do with the, with the competency of the patients, of the people providing care in terms of um, treating people who are using drugs. So we've, um, in ter terms of talking about harm reduction, um, it is about meeting patients where they're at. Um, harm reduction aims to reduce the negative effects of health behaviors and to promote well-being at the same time respecting a, a person's choices around their own health, regardless of, of where they are. And then cultural humility is to recognize one's own worldview and biases and to consciously de-emphasize them so that you are, you are able to allow the patient's um, cultural beliefs and, and priorities to um, direct their own, their own care and to just be providing information to the patient that might be helpful to them. So as a provider, um, I have information about, you know, chemical dependency, I have information about, um, about buprenorphine and suboxone and statistics around what it means to be on suboxone versus versus using what the implications for the baby are and I my job is to provide that information to patients and then they if they 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 can then make decisions about their about their own health and the choices that they want to make. Um, also, trauma informed care we we strive to provide a safe and collaborative space that um, empowers patients to make choices regarding their own care. So these three sort of concepts of harm reduction, cultural humility, and trauma-informed care sort of provide the basis for the care that we're providing to our pregnant patients. My favorite quote um, by Johan Hari, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, the opposite of addiction is connection. And so having patients be able to come and form those connections earlier on in their pregnancies really, um, really, I think helps to helps them to choose a path that, that works well for them and their families. Um, a mutual goal is to um, is to get the parent home with their baby. Um, we we transparently talk about mandated reporting and CPS at the first meeting so that they know what to expect and how to how to um, how to situ how to situate themselves and how to plan. Um, we offer them support in navigating those concerns and we try to get on the same side of the problem of them. I am patient, you know, I, I'm not telling patients what to do. I'm telling them what their options are and I'm telling them what I, what they might experience given whatever choice they make. Um, a lot of times people using substance can be, um, are lost, lost to follow up at some point in their pregnancy and we would we continue to try and reach out to them and we also accept that relapse is part of recovery. And when patients reconnect with us after relapse, we try to we try to emphasize that 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 success is often incremental in terms of meeting their goals, and that and that we're just very glad that they're continuing to try to make those connections again. You know, the connect that, that continued continuing attempt to connect is such a such a, a sign of a patient's trying to step on the path that they're choosing and we're here and uh, we're trying to help them with that. Um, 
here, I'm forgetting to say thing. Um, so if we if you do have to report um, to CPS, um, it's important again to have had those discussions at the first visit so patients are aware that that what the transparently aware of what that you might need to report um, later on, uh, discuss what the report means and why it is being made. Um, and then we offer supports like project child and social supports. So our experience with, um, with this is that if women are in a treatment program, they have ongoing consistent appointments with their medical team, they're engaged with um, MAT like um, buprenorphine or methadone by 32 weeks. Um, it shows stability and, and most, in most of those cases, um, women are able to go home with their children. When they're reported, the CPS staff screens the reports and the report is filed unless the parent has an existing CPS case open. Um, when we make a report, we are aware that this can have a negative impact on patients and parents. It can interfere with trust. It can make feel, women feel stigmatized and it doesn't address their diagnosis in a positive way. Um, with, the, with the new mandated reporting laws, it gives a little bit more time to develop that trust. And um, as well, and sometimes patients would choose to self-report in order to get to get the support that um, pro programs such as Project Child can give. Um, mothers are tested at the time of delivery, including cord blood, um, which can indicate use any time during the pregnancy. So we try try to um, let them know that 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 will happen. As far as in the clinic, we used to do routine um, toxicology screen on pregnant women. Um, at some point, we started to we recognize that 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 was a problem problematic, and we made it we don't routinely test unless somebody is on suboxone. We allow patients to choose whether they want to be tested or not. Um, uh, we offer we offer testing though because patients some a lot of times want to demonstrate their sobriety during pregnancy, so we offer the testing. We explain the, we explain the consequences of. Um, of uh, not having new toxins and having new toxins. And uh, we also talk to the, to the um, hospital and ask what their policies are um, around women who use drugs. Uh, women want to know that their birth experience is going to be as positive and non-judgmental as possible and um, that the, their providers are gonna understand their, their, me their medical conditions and that includes prenatal drug use. Um, our patients often uh, report that they are not treated well when if they've been tested positive for drug use at any time during their pregnancy. And um, that is, it's very difficult for a parent to show up at labor and delivery and to have worked really hard to get to the, where they're at and to achieve sobriety by the end of pregnancy and then still to feel like they're, they're judged for their use after they've worked so hard. Um, so, in terms of engaging in care, um, we try to reduce stigma and provide support. Um, it's a, so important just to get women in the door, creating those connections. And again, those new mandated reporting laws really help. Um, we have to address stigma and shame. Um, we do not do routine toxicology and we provide information on mandated reporting. Just what, can, I, can we pause for a second? I need a cord. I'm so sorry. Um, I may lose power. Um, so specific considerations during pregnancy. Um, um, so again, we support them where they're at. We try and make sure that we have prenatal vitamins to give. You know, like if the extra step of going to a pharmacy can sometimes be overwhelming. So for, especially for patients who are actively using or in chaotic use, we try and um, give, them pre, give them prenatal vitamins. We provide information on safe use and overdose, even while they're pregnant. Um, we provide information on pregnancy care, information on what to do if they don't do care because they may they may they may not choose to engage in care. Um, provide them information on again what they, what to expect from the hospitals. We advocate in communicating with other systems, hospitals, and other clinics. We will schedule more frequent um, visits to check in. So I'll, I even if a patient is not on Suboxone, I will I will offer to see them more frequently, like every one to two weeks, just to check in and see where they're at, make sure that they have all the resources that they need. I think a doula is a wonderful choice for uh, for someone who is using, especially. But of course, you'd want a doula who who is comfortable and competent in teaching and treating, working with um, parents who are who are actively using. As far as medical care, 
Um, there's not a lot of difference um, overall in treating a patient who's, who has a history of use and, and, and if a patient is on Suboxone, really no changes. Um, but um, we do schedule out to the 20 ultrasound, which is the ultrasound for anatomy um, uh, with, with uh, perinatology. Um, and then if there's ongoing use, they will, they will do growth scans every four weeks with twice weekly or weekly monitoring after 32 weeks of pregnancy. Um, I think that there is with some, with some chemicals, there is an increased risk of uh, birth defects um, that is more common with alcohol. And, um, and I don't, and with, the data is unclear, but I think, I think cocaine and methamphetamine has, has a slightly higher risk of adverse outcomes than um, opiates. So just in terms of the treatment options, um, of course, I just want to cover briefly. We're not going to go, go to it in great depth, but opioid agonist um, therapy, methadone and buprenorphine are options. And buprenorphine is, of course, the active ingredient suboxone, misspelled here. And then alternatives are naltrexone and medication-assisted withdrawal. Um, just, just to be clear, buprenorphine is fast becoming the preferred, the preferred choice for treatment during pregnancy. Um, it's the lower risk of withdrawal, um, um, easier to, you don't have to go and get daily dosing when, you, when you're on it, although that, that is an option and, um, and, and women seem to be very comfortable with it. Um, naltrexone is, is offered sometimes, but it actually has the risk of um, open, overdose if the person stops it, so that, and as does methadone. And, um, and uh, then of course there's medication assisted withdrawal, which is sort of tapering somebody, somebody offsets suboxone. This, all the studies demonstrate that the, the best outcome for a pregnancy is for, pa for patients who are on buprenorphine, their babies are less likely to have withdrawal when they're born, and they are less likely to relapse. Um, so we talk to the patients, we assess their risks when they come in, we review their use history, we assess and educate them regarding safer use, we make sure that they have um, Narcan, we make sure they have clean supplies if they need them, um, we make sure that they understand, under, you know, educate them about, about ways to use more safely if that's appropriate. Um, we ask them if they've tried buprenorphine before and how it worked for them. We ask them how long they expect to be on medication um, because a lot of patients have the sense that they, they, they're doing their best to get off of everything. So they think that, that buprenorphine is a stepping stone to not, not being on anything. And um, as I said, studies show that, 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 that a lot of times um, results in relapse and is at a higher risk for the, during the pregnancy. And then we also talk about the stress and risk of babies' first years. I think during pregnancy, a lot of women are just trying to get through the pregnancy, get to the delivery sober, but, uh, but we try to help them just sort of stretch their view beyond to the first few years of their baby's life because it's very stressful. Anybody who's had an infant knows that it's a, it's a lot of sleeplessness, tiredness, exhaustion, and stress, and that can increase chances of relapse. And so to, we, I always try to have a conversation with patients about remaining on Suboxone through the first years of a few years of baby's life and then until they're from the place where they've really been able to address the housing, the mental health, and any other issues that have, may have arisen during the, related to their use. Um, we also talk to them about, them about what they know about CPS and mandated reporting and trying to address their concerns around that. We ask them if people around them are supportive or using, um, we sort of kind of assess how much internalized stigma they have, how they, um, how they how they feel what they're feeling about the use how much how much they how much they're stigmatizing themselves and and um, and we are especially important of course as partner and immediate family and we offer to um, have those people come in and join them for an appointment so we can talk with them together to to address some of these things we we of course make sure that they uh, where they're at with housing if they have their basic resources being met and sort of try and connect them to to um, to housing resources, food, food, um, uh, legal resources, anything that they need to sort of um, get get to a good place for, for the pregnancy and for after baby's born. Um, we do assess what, for sex trafficking, sex work, um, try, and, try and see where they're at with that and see if they need any resources around that. We ask them about their safety 
and assess their, to see if they need any mental health resources. Um, so just to cover opioid ag agonist pharmacotherapy, and we're talking about Suboxone here, um, what it does for the patient, um, prevents opioid withdrawal symptoms, it decreases their risk of overdose, decreases their risk of infection, um, and especially if the person's IV, IV using, it improves their engagement in prenatal care, it improves their participation in treatment programs, they're able to, to be present and, and participate in that, it reduces the risk of relapse, it reduces the risk of complications of opioid use in pregnancy, and these complications are growth restriction, infection, injury, overdose, and preterm birth. And just to be clear, these risks of complications of opioid use in pregnancy a lot of times are related to just sort of the chaos that comes around opioid use and is not, except for overdose, not really an, an impact of the opiates themselves as a substance. Um, uh, with, with opioid agonist ther pharmacotherapy, neonatal natal abstinence syndrome may occur, uh, but um, we provide education around that and there's a lot of strat there are strategies to minimize that and that includes like um, skin to skin contact and um, active, really active involvement in the mom, with of mom and in, or the parent in um, in being there and with the, with the, with the baby and and um, and touch. Um, so it's a harm reduction services around around opioid use disorder during pregnancy. We talked about the medication assist treatment. We provide medication first. It's the it's the first thing we do, and then we worry about treatment, you know, chemical health treatment and everything else after that. Um, we absence does show a lower success rate in um, in babies being born um, with, without neonatal absence syndrome and having complications. So we're talking to that decision. Talked about providing stem syringe services, including rates, Narcan education and distribution. And then we try and make sure that we are available for walk-in appointments for any concerns related to substance use, abscesses, um, to STI screening, including HIV and hepatitis C, chemical dependency care coordination, including referrals to detox treatment. Um, outreach is, is important in um, providing that bridge and, and that first connection to patients. So um, we uh, we have we have we provide outreach specifically to um, um, places where unsheltered people are, and um, and we have attempted multiple have provided virtual visits to pregnant patient people. Um, although a lot of times we find that they they are more effective when they come into the clinic. We are trying to make that those first connections possible outside of NAC. Um, Outreach will start off as an anonymous conversation with outreach staff and nurses around prenatal care. And at that time, we offer resources, bags of supply, prenatal vitamins, kind of talk people through things like mandated reporting, what to expect, um, talk about how important prenatal care is, the benefits of prenatal care, discuss, discuss their options, um, discuss which, where they might want to go, hospitals and clinics. We talk to them um, about what to look for in the later tri trimesters in terms of when to seek care, like fetal kick counts, signs of labor, and when to go in, so that they, they have some information so that they're not taken by surprise. Um, after baby's born, um, it's really important to continue care coordination support. Uh, we talk about rel a relapse plan while they're pregnant and before they deliver and if they postpartum to visit. There is an especially high risk of relapse after delivery. Like I said, a lot of patients see the delivery sort of as a goalpost and then kind of like, like let the air out after the delivery and then and they let their guard, they let their guard down and they and there's a higher possibility of relapse. Um, and then some patients may want to disengage from MAT services after delivery because of the stigma. And so we just try to make sure we've had those conversations before, before delivery and, and frequently after delivery. Um, we have conversations on contraception, of course, and um, this is upset, assist ongoing during the pregnancy. It's not a one-time conversation, and uh, we certainly don't push it if the person isn't interested. And um, throughout the pregnancy and after delivery, we talk about safer use in parenting, um, talk about mandated reporting. Use is not a reason to report a parent, but uh, we do talk about like it, not using if they're the, sole, the only person looking after the child. And um, and to not to not to use around the child, and then also about keeping supplies safe, like locking locking up 
any supplies so that the baby can get into them and also the spots. Conversations that we have, uh, we offer to discuss drug use, safe use of Narcan, even if pregnant, and I know I'm including myself here. We discuss the effects of drugs on the fetus and we discuss neonatal absence syndrome. We also discuss breastfeeding and it's important to note that it's encouraged while a patient is on um, MATs, you know, whether suboxone or methadone, especially in the context of neonatal absence syndrome, it can actually help. Uh, it decreases the severity of neonatal, neonatal absence syndrome and uh, can shorten hospital stays and imp improves attachments and provides immunity to the baby. Um, it's, not it's not recommended if a patient is currently using, um, has HIV infection, and, and if a patient has any bleeding, like when they're first breastfeeding, if they're sensitive and if they're having bleeding nipples, then, then if they have hepatitis C, they should not breastfeed. Um, again, just to review the tough conversations, it's important to talk about mandated reporting. It's important that we as providers educate ourselves about mandated reporting so that we can give patients accurate information so they can protect themselves and their family and advocate for themselves. It's important to be transparent, to be transparent about when you would consider reporting or when you're mandated to report and, um, and treat it like any other difficult conversation and um, it can help foster trust. And, also, I don't think I've mentioned this, but if we do do a mandated report, we try to, as much as we can, we try and let the patient know that we are going to do a mandated report. Um, we all offer support in any way that we can. We let, them, we let them know that our goal is also to have their baby come home with them, um, that we're working with them to get to assist them on their journey. And um, as, all the way through assessing the needs and discussing the hard things, um, making it a safe place to discuss hard things like survival sex, the safety at home, domestic violence, um, resources, all of that. And, um, and so often I see um, in these situations uh, providers leveraging well-being of the baby and striking fear, you know, being, striking fear into patients, like talking about all the terrible things that can happen and, and trying to um, sort of leverage that, that obvious desire that parents have to protect their children and um, use that to, to sort of strong arm patients into a decision that feels like to the provider, like the right decision that may or may not be the right decision for the patient at home. And recognize that if CPS doesn't get involved, uh, patients are gonna need additional support, especially if baby doesn't come home with them. And um, they, a lot of times they become very discouraged um, and feel hopeless at that time. So staying connected with patients, um, making continuing conversations, talking to them, letting them know that um, you're there for them is so very important. So in summary, um, method medic medication assisted treatment with buprenorphine and methadone is a preferred treatment for opioid use disorder in pregnant women, not abstinence, and uh, not medication assisted withdrawal. And harm reduction supports patients in navigating pregnancy in the context of drug use and as a pathway to improve outcomes. Some references here. And I'm open for any questions. I always talk too fast. I, apo I apologize. I have a question. Yes, Tina. What is neonatal abstinence syndrome? Oh, I'm so sorry. So, um, so neonatal abstinence syndrome um, is ba is basically withdrawal in the baby after the baby's born. So, if a if a parent is using um, any opiate, whether it's um, fentanyl, heroin, um, buprenorphine, or suboxone, or methadone, there is a po possibility when the baby is born this the that they stop getting that substance and then they go through withdrawal just as our patients go through withdrawal when they stop using opiates. Um, I think I, the rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome is much lower for patients on Suboxone than, than on, than on um, fentanyl or, or heroin or other, other opiates. Um, it can still happen. Um, it also, it also um, is a lot better if, if they're, the babies are held, skip skin contact, check, you know, like doing, doing massages. There's a lot of ways to treat it. And then the, the ultimately, if the, none of that helps, then they can be treated by providing opiates, um, usually in the form of morphine um, by, by a prescriber. 
Um, but then, of course, the um, so if, if a mother is using suboxone, taking suboxone, using suboxone, then then that's that does pass through the breast milk and can help to to take them to taper off the, the opiates as well. Thank you, Tina. I'm sorry I didn't make that more clear. Um, I've got a question about um, the buprenorphine being um, preferred over the suboxone for pregnant people. Mm -hmm. um, um, I mean, Subutex versus suboxone, like the buprenorphine only versus the- Right, yep, yep. So um, is that is that like when um, initially starting on suboxone or, or, um, or Subutex, or is it, also, like if somebody's already on Suboxone, would a provider want to switch them to Subutex? That's a good question. So very good question, actually. And I, I probably should have covered that too. Um, the, so so when, 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 so in providing care for pregnant women, there's like, there's like the, that sort of first do no harm thing, impulse is probably strongest during pregnancy than any other, any other medical condition that I, that I treat. So, so for example, for gest for gestational diabetes, we, we use the same medication that, that was first proven to be safe for pregnant patients 20, 30 years ago. It's always Levomir because that's the one, but that all the studies show that Levomir and Lantus are the same. You know, they're, it's just that that's the familiar one and nobody wants to take a chance with an, with an unborn child that that's going to have an adverse effect. So there's a there's a there's a anxiety around suboxone because there's naloxone in it and then, and so so a lot of prenatal providers will opt for the subutex and initially they were like subutex is safer during pregnancy. We routinely use suboxone during pregnancy the, the because it doesn't the it doesn't cause withdrawal it doesn't have adverse effects and so we just we continue suboxone we do not we don't do the subutex. And that it's completely safe, no adverse effects. It's just that there is a precedent, and there is a uh, what's the it, it's the most common it's the common thing that prenatal providers do is to do the subutex. So a lot of some providers will switch them to subutex during pregnancy. It's not necessary. It, sub suboxone is safe, um, and we do it routinely in that. So then just a follow-up question. So um, would it be more like, because when, um, when naloxone is taken orally, the bioavailability is like really like oh. low to like nothing, right? So would it exactly. be more for, um, in, in case somebody should um, use it IV? That that could so you're so you're you're getting into you're definitely you're getting into that bigger argument about suboxone versus subutex, which which I, we I, we ask ourselves about all the time. So why are we giving our patients suboxone instead of subutex in general, right? That's that's kind of the the question. And I think you're I think you're absolutely right. There's a there's this idea that if if people inject the suboxone, then the Narcan will block the effects of the suboxone, and if they inject the subutex, then they'll get they'll get the euphoria. I was just reading an article on that, this China, and honestly, at this point, the only thing that stops me from prescribing the subutex, the suboxone, stops me from providing the subutex versus suboxone is the street value of it. That's the really, that's really the only reason at this point in my practice, I am choosing to provide suboxone because of the diversion factor. One thing that China also mentioned um, is you kind of alluded to precipitated withdrawal. Um, right. The, the risk of precipitated withdrawal is still present when somebody is taking subutex. So the fact that there's naloxone in the suboxone isn't what causes the patient to have precipitated withdrawal. Yeah. So there's on the street, there's this idea that, oh, if I just take subutex, I'm not going to have precipitated withdrawal because it's the naloxone, um, and that's actually not true, and people are still putting themselves yeah. into precipitated withdrawal. And, and the article that I read about the subutex versus the suboxone, that even if you inject suboxone versus subutex, there's apparent a lot of case, like if you go on the, the chat boards, there's a lot of people that talk about injecting suboxone and getting a pretty good effect of it from it and not having precipitated withdrawal. The naloxone mm -hmm. in the suboxone appears to not really be enough 
to cause precipitated withdrawal. And additionally, the Suboxone is much longer lasting than the, than the Naloxone. So it doesn't really matter. So it's really, I think, to be honest, if I'm really frank about it, I think that the Subutex versus Suboxone is something that the medical community created mm -hmm. as a way to make themselves feel but that within the context of stigma and sort of like, yeah. like this, like just like, just like um, OxyContin was created to supposedly prevent abuse of oxycodone and then ended up being a whole nother, whole nother set of complications with OxyContin, right? So um, as I said, if, if I were able to, I would, would I wish that Subutex was the only thing on the market because, because then you wouldn't have this differential with the diversion because, um, because the Subutex gets, is more expensive to buy. Right. So, yeah. Thank that's, you. Very that's helpful. my two cents. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. So that that does lead me to another question, and hopefully somebody else is thinking this too. Um, so now we're having to do all these micro inductions. Um, how do you do that with somebody who's pregnant? Oh. Um, yes. it, yeah. Good question. I, I'm writing that for my next talk. To <laughs> so, um, so for somebody who is pregnant, I um, who's pregnant, we can do a micro induction. In somebody's pregnant. I, there is, there is a day, there is a um, not well documented, documented, but there is a risk of precipitated withdrawal in the in the fetus as well as the mom if you if you go through withdrawal. So, if a, if a mom is trying to get onto suboxone and having to go through withdrawal. It, the micro induction makes a lot of sense because it's sort of a gradual change, but they will continue to use, have to continue to use during that micro induction so to prevent baby from going through withdrawal as well as themselves. Um, so, so we will tell pregnant women who are doing the micro induction to, to, um, to continue to use if they're able to. Sometimes when women come in to see me, and they're, they're pregnant and they're ready to get onto Suboxone and to get off of, and they want to stop using fentanyl or whatever, they're, the thought of, they've, they've, they've come through an immense mental barrier. To, okay, I'm ready to do this. It's gonna be hard and I'm ready to do it. And then we tell them you're gonna to have to continue to use. And that is kind of, that is a hard thing for them to, to do. When, if they've made that decision, it's hard for them to then have to, it can be very triggering, et cetera. So, in, on a case by case basis, I will sometimes provide a prescription for, um, for uh, Percocets to get them through those first few days. I will do it one time for a patient during pregnancy. I'm very clear, I'll do this for you one time um, just to get you through this place. If they need to do it again, then they can, we can still do a micro induction for them, but they, but I won't do the oxycodone. And I don't do it for everybody. I sort of assess where they're at in terms of their comfort level and what they're feeling. But if, if a woman is, if I, I can just, I can usually through the conversation, they're just like, I just don't, I'll ask them, can you, do you feel comfortable continuing to use what, until you get to this place? And if they say yes, then great. If they're like devastated at that, at that thought, then I will, I will offer them this option. It also depends on their stability, where they're at, um, all of that, if I'm able to offer that. The other context in which I will offer it more than once is if I know that they're going into treatment and they're in a control setting and that I can, I can prescribe it for them um, and, and then I, they can get it from wherever they're at and, then I, and, they, and I know that they'll, they'll, be, they'll be okay for those few days. And because they're not gonna have access to fentanyl if they're in treatment. Then that I will. That's that's the main reason for doing a lot of. Valerie has a question. Valerie, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's your opinion of sublocate during pregnancy? Um, I think that I think that I did would be this. I don't know that I would do that during. I don't know that I would start that during pregnancy just because it's a, it's. It, I guess, I guess I should say this. I haven't started it during pregnancy. I think I would want to look look into it. I would guess it fine but I think that I think that I think that you supplicate require requires med adjustments and sort of keeping an eye keeping an eye on the levels and I think that it sort of can make you have to adjust levels and things like that so I would probably prefer to do suboxone through the pregnancy and then supplicate after and I also don't really know I'm 
I actually, I don't really know what those, you know, could supplicate towards heart in the body and then the belly is right there. I, so I think that I would like to find some more information about that. I would, my first answer is I'd be hesitant. And then I think that I need to, I also need to go look that up. Thank you. That was a good, very good question. And one I didn't really know the answer to fully. I'm intrigued now. Does anybody, has anybody else heard of uh, sub, I supplicate during pregnancy? I would guess that it's not recommended during pregnancy just because it's a new, a new, but I'll do the research. Yeah. I'll bring the answer back. And if there were, um, um, you know, some kind of like emergency surgery or anything that needed to be, be done, wouldn't that be bad because then they couldn't get- the So payment? the mm -hmm. interesting thing about supplicate is you can surgically remove it. But oh, also, it yeah, you can cut it out. Wow. I also want yeah. to say that when a patient is on Suboxone or Sublocate, they can still have medication to manage pain. So if you are on Suboxone, you take it every day, you've been doing it for years, and you end up in a major car accident in the hospital, and you are you know, have surgeries, and they want to give you Dilaudid and whatever, they can still do that. You will still get the benefit, the analgesic effect from the pain medication. Um, so you can, you can do both, um, which I know is kind of confusing to a lot of providers, um, yeah. and also just patients. Yeah. So we have, our, that is another conversation that we have with patients during pregnancy is on pain management. And then, and we try and make sure that we're, we have a very good relate, you know, we know, we know the hospitals that we work with, but if, if our patients are going to a hospital that we don't normally work with, we talk about pain management because if, if you have a provider who doesn't do Suboxone, they don't understand that you don't have to start stop the Suboxone to put pain management on top of that. Also, like in other contexts, you can split dose the Suboxone in order, in order to get better pain management effects. So like you do the Suboxone twice a day instead of once a day, and then it actually functions better for pain control than, than otherwise. Also, the other conversation I have around patients whether they're pregnant or not around pain management is that for how they feel about taking pills because for some patients that's very triggering and they would like to avoid it where possible. And so we try to, we talk, we ask them if that's how they feel and then we would talk to their provider about finding a way to manage their pain that doesn't involve something that's triggering for them. And that's a, again, patient by patient. Any last questions? It's 12.57. I can talk about Spoxone all day. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about Spoxone all day. <laughs> Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, Tina, can you um, take us out with our, when our next, what our next thing is? Sure, I actually, I don't know, Lindsay, what's our next one? So the next one in two weeks, so that's October 19th, we have Melanie Nadeau, and she'll be talking about centering culture in the treatment of opioid use disorder. So please come back and join us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody.